Hey everyone, welcome back. Ready to dive into some serious AI ethics today. Always exciting to talk ethics, right? Absolutely, especially with something like this, The Seven Directives. From AimQuest Corporation. Exactly, they put this book out there. Which, by the way, you can grab on Amazon if you're interested. Definitely recommend checking it out. But yeah, it's all about setting some guiding principles for how we develop AI ethically, which, let's face it, is kind of a big deal these days. It's not just about the algorithms themselves, but about making sure they're built with a focus on humanity. And that's where this book really digs deep. I mean, it goes all the way back to the very beginning. To the beginning? Yeah, like 1956, when the term artificial intelligence was first coined. Can you believe it? 1956? That feels like ages ago in the tech world. Right. Back then, AI was all about rule-based systems. Very different from what we see now. Now it's all data-driven. AI practically thinks for itself. Kind of wild when you think about it. It is. And that's where things get really interesting, ethically speaking. We're talking about self-driving cars making life or death decisions. Whoa. Okay, hold on. Self-driving cars, right? Imagine this. The car has to choose between two bad options. How does it decide who's responsible? Exactly. That's where the book's Directive 4 comes in. Balancing AI self-preservation and human well-being. So even if the AI, like a self-driving car, is in a tough spot, human safety is the priority. It's tricky, though, because as these systems get more complex, pinpointing responsibility becomes really difficult. It's like, who do you blame if something goes wrong? Right. And that complexity isn't just limited to self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. The book uses AI in healthcare as another example. It has the potential to be amazing. But also pretty risky if we're not careful, right? Absolutely. It's like we're essentially trusting machines with our lives. Exactly. And that brings us back to that first directive, protecting human life and dignity. So making sure AI is never used to harm people, physically or otherwise. Yes. And the otherwise is important, too, because it's not just about physical safety. We have to think about mental well-being, too. Oh, interesting. How so? Well, think about all those AI-powered mental health apps popping up. They could be great for access, but we need to be careful. Right, because mental health is so complex. Exactly. It's not as simple as an algorithm just give you a diagnosis. You need human understanding, empathy, all those things AI struggles with. It's true. Technology can only go so far. But, you know, speaking of potential downsides, something that really stuck with me from the book was its focus on threats. Yeah, direct to five, right? Identifying and addressing adversarial forces. That's the one. And it's not just about, like some evil AI taking over the world, though I admit that thought crossed my mind. It's a classic for a reason. But the book goes deeper than that. Which is good because honestly, that whole AI rebellion scenario is a bit much, even for me. Totally. What the directive emphasizes is being proactive, not reactive. Think about it. We need to identify potential issues before they become huge problems. Like what? Give me an example. Well, for starters, we have those who might want to use AI for malicious purposes, but it goes beyond that we need to anticipate unintended consequences, design flaws that could cause harm. And even the possibility of AI itself becoming a problem. Precisely. Like, what if its goals end up misaligned with human values? It's not about AI being evil, but about making sure we're aligned every step of the way. Now, that is a little unsettling. Makes you think twice about those sci-fi movies where the robots take over, huh? Right. But hey, that's why we're having this discussion. This directive is about being aware, vigilant, and always asking what if. And building in safeguards. Absolutely. Yeah. At every level, from the algorithms themselves to the entire AI ecosystem. So it's really about making sure that AI, with all its potential, is used responsibly. Exactly. And that responsibility isn't just on the shoulders of developers. It's bigger than that. You're talking about, like, a collective effort. Absolutely. The book even uses this interesting phrase, a social contract for the age of AI. Okay, a social contract for AI. I like that. Yeah. So where do we even begin? What are the rules we should be following? Well, the book really stresses transparency. Like, we need to be able to look under the hood. Meaning? We need to understand how these systems work, how they make decisions, what data they're using. It can't just be a black box, right? Especially when it comes to something as important as healthcare. Right. We were talking about AI and healthcare earlier, and the stakes are pretty high there. Absolutely. And that's a big focus in the book. It highlights the potential, which is huge. Imagine AI catching diseases before you even have symptoms. That would be revolutionary. Right. But it also emphasizes caution because using AI in this way, dealing with people's health, it requires a different level of scrutiny. 
Especially when you're talking about sensitive health data, there needs to be some serious protection there. 100%. And that's where Directive 2 comes into play, ensuring data integrity and algorithmic transparency. So it's not just about the data itself, but also how it's used, right? Right. The data needs to be accurate, unbiased, representative, but the algorithms themselves need to be open to examination. We need to understand why an AI system makes the recommendations it does. Especially in healthcare. We're talking about potentially life-altering decisions here. Trust is paramount. And that trust, it doesn't just appear out of thin air. It has to be earned. Exactly. And part of earning that trust is addressing something we've touched on a bit, bias. Which can pop up in a lot of ways, right? Oh, absolutely. It oh. can creep into AI systems in so many ways, starting with the data it's trained on. Right. Like if the data itself reflects existing biases in society. Exactly. But it goes beyond that. Bias can even be present in how the algorithms are designed, even if unintentionally. So we need to be thinking about bias on multiple levels then. Absolutely. And that's where Directive 3 comes in, promoting inclusivity and challenging bias. We need to make sure AI benefits everyone, not just a select few. And that requires constant vigilance, right? Always looking for those hidden biases, both in the data and the algorithms. Exactly. Because even unintentional bias can have real-world consequences. Think about an AI system, maybe one that's used to help allocate medical resources. Oh, wow. Yeah. If it's trained on biased data, it could perpetuate inequalities in healthcare access, even if that wasn't the intention. Right. And that's just one example. It's a good reminder that we're not just dealing with code here, but with real human lives. There's a weight to that, for sure. Yeah. It's like we're walking this fine line between the potential of AI and the responsibility that comes with it, you know? Yeah. Making sure it doesn't make existing problems worse. It's a balance, that's for sure. And that's why the book goes beyond just building ethical AI. Mm -hmm. It emphasizes fostering an ethical AI ecosystem. An ethical AI ecosystem. Okay, so what does that look like? How do we even begin to build something like that? Well, education is a big part of it. Okay, makes sense. Directive 6. Promoting Ethical AI Education and Awareness argues that we need to give people the tools to understand this stuff. And not just the tech people, everyone. So not just teaching people how to code AI, but like how to think about its impact on the world. Exactly. It needs to start early, integrating these conversations into school, creating a culture of responsibility in tech. It's about getting people comfortable asking the tough questions, right? Yes. Like, what are the downsides? Who really benefits? Who might get left behind in all this? It's about more than just the technology itself. It's about the human side of it all. Completely. And those questions, they lead right into that final directive, Directive 7, ensuring ongoing ethical oversight and adaptation. So it's about staying vigilant even after the AI is out there. Exactly. The book makes it clear this isn't a one-time thing. The ethical landscape of AI, it's constantly changing as technology evolves as we see its impact. It's ongoing. So it's about constantly evaluating, making sure things are still ethical, even as AI changes. Precisely. We have to constantly ask ourselves, are the rules we have still relevant? Are there new risks we haven't thought of? How do we adapt to make sure AI is a force for good in the world? That's a lot to grapple with. It is, but that's why I found this book so interesting. It's more than just a how-to on AI. It's a call to action for everyone. Because ultimately, the future of AI, it's not up to the machines. It's up to us. Exactly. And that brings us back to the social contract we were talking about. We all have a role to play here. Developers, policymakers, even podcast listeners tuning in right now. It's about having these conversations, being informed, and making our voices heard. If you want to explore this topic further, the seven directives, definitely check it out. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. Until next time, keep those questions coming, keep learning, and let's build a future where AI truly benefits everyone.